Well, hello and thank you for joining me for this week's SPSJ online service. Uh, we're in our fourth week in our series of looking at what it means for us to be following Jesus in our prayer life. Uh, and Sheila is going to be joining us today um, to look through a couple of passages for us and help us think about what it means to have selfless lives, to pray in a selfless way. Uh, before I read those passages and hand over to Sheila, let me just pray for us now. Father God, as we come to meet you, may we know you here with us. As we come to learn more about me, may we discover that you have been waiting for us and are alongside us. As we share in exploring your word, may we find that your word has been speaking to us and continues to speak to us in our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. So our Bible passages, uh, one of them comes from Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy, um, and I'm reading from chapter 1, starting at verse 18 and then into the beginning of chapter 2. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction on keeping in Malola. I'll start that again. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you. So that by following them, you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. I urge then, first of all, that requests and prayers and intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and for those, all those in authority that we might live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And our second passage coming from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, uh, comes towards the end of what's called the Sermon on the Mount, a great chunk of teaching that Jesus gave his followers. Chapter 5, starting at verse 38. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So as we uh, hand over to Sheila to hear those passages shared and for her to hear what she's got to say on them. Let's pray for her now. Lord, we thank you for Sheila and for her witness and her time of preparing for today. We pray that she would speak well to us and that our ears would be open to hear what you are saying. Amen. Welcome everyone. It's good to be with you again. Well, this is our fourth in this series called Showing Jesus is Lord in Our Prayers. And just as a reminder, the first sermon was about being totally dependent. The second was about being expectant. The third was about being thankful. And today we're talking about being selfless in our prayers. But before I begin speaking about praying selflessly, I want to point out that it isn't wrong to pray for ourselves. Jesus taught us a prayer that is familiar to us all. Give us today our daily bread. And this can be for practical things we need in our life. For example, Alistair, a friend of mine, used to be a curate in Sheffield many years ago. And one day, a couple who'd just become Christians knocked at his door and said they had no food. They didn't have a job at the time, and it was going to be several weeks before they could get some financial help from the government. Alistair said to them, go home and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. After they'd gone, my friend pondered on why he hadn't given them some food. But a few hours later, the couple came back and said they prayed the prayer, and shortly afterwards a knock came at the door. Outside the door, someone had left a huge box of food. It literally was an answer to that prayer, give us today our daily bread. They experienced the God who provides. 
And you can imagine what that did to their faith, knowing that God had heard their pray prayers and answered them. Naturally, it's very easy for us to come to God with a long list of needs for ourselves. It's understandable. After all, we know that God is interested in everything close to our hearts. So it's not about stopping those prayers. However, listening is really important. Using that well-used illustration, we wouldn't go into a doctor's surgery and tell them all that's wrong with us and leave before the doctor tells us what medication we need. Prayer is communication. It's not just one-way traffic. And as we sit in the Lord's presence and listen, we hear his heartbeat, not just for ourselves, but for our world. Of course, selfless prayers are when we pray for other people's needs. Richard Foster, in his excellent book entitled Prayer, has this to say about intercessory prayer, prayer where we're interceding for others. If we truly love people, we will desire for them far more than it is within our power to give them, and this will lead us to prayer. Intercession is a way of loving others. When we move from petition to intercession, we are moving our centre of gravity from our own needs to the needs and concerns of others. However, there is another aspect of prayer and a hugely important one, and that is praying into what God wants. As we pray and listen, we discern God's will for us and for the world. As we listen, we find our hearts turning, our prayers changing as we connect with the heartbeat of God. We will find his abundant compassion for people. We will feel his longing for this world to change. We are watching our world, our nation, spiralling into godlessness and chaos. And Jesus wants us to reverse that and he needs our help. So what does Jesus want? What is the big picture? Well, the big picture is that his kingdom comes on earth, that he saturates us with his presence and that his glory is seen on earth. That is what he longs for. That is what his heart is beating for. And that's why Paul says, I urge them, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. And that's why we should pray for people like Putin and those who are intent on evil. Pray specifically that they will meet with Jesus and be changed, and if they aren't, then be removed from their position. It is crucially important because, as Paul says in Ephesians 6 verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. When we look at someone like Putin, we can easily forget that our struggle isn't against him as a person, but against the enemy who's influencing him and wreaking havoc. If the Lord's kingdom comes and his will is done on earth, it will be transformational. There will be order instead of chaos, peace instead of war, joy instead of sadness, hope and purpose instead of despair. So as we tune into the Lord's heartbeat, we realise that we need to tune into his big picture. Jesus wants to bring heaven to earth and he needs us to be part of that by praying specifically, not generally. Our prayers are powerful and precious. In Revelation 8 verses 3 to 4, we read that our prayers are collected and given, given to God with incense after which an angel filled the censer with fire from the altar and hurled it onto the earth, which made peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. It's a powerful image, isn't it? Perhaps we can look at thunderstorms in a different light now. There's no doubt that some people find it easier to pray than others, but we're all urged to do so. Bishop Richard has called us to join in a year of prayer in this diocese, and as an encouragement, there are events throughout the year giving opportunities to explore different ways of praying. And it's definitely worth attending these events if you possibly can. 
Jesus calls us all to pray for his kingdom to come. When we pray, amazing things can happen. It might not be straight away, but it just might. In 1949, two sisters, Peggy and Christine Smith, felt a burden to pray about the lack of young people in their church. Living in the Hebrides, they were both housebound. One was 84 years of age and blind, and the other was 82 and crippled with arthritis. One night, one of them received a vision of young people filling the church, so they called their minister and urged him to pray. People in the church caught the vision and they began a late night five hour prayer meeting twice a week, starting at 10 p.m. As they prayed, one of the sisters had a vision of Duncan Campbell, a Scottish evangelist, coming to speak. On the day they finally managed to get him to come to the island, there was an overwhelming sense of the presence of God, and both young and old people were impacted. The churches became filled with young people. Many lives were transformed and miraculous signs and wonders were seen. During one prayer meeting in Arnold, the building literally shook with the holy presence of the Lord, which reminds us of Acts 4 verse 28, where it tells us that the room where the early church was meeting visibly shook while they prayed. Over the next four years, the majority of the population in the Outer Hebrides surrendered their lives to Jesus. It's really hard to imagine, isn't it? Wouldn't it be wonderful if that happened in our nation? One of my friends recently visited the island and met with some who were involved at the time, and he's since written a book about it. Those who lived through those years insist their experiences can only be attributed to a sovereign act of God in answer to their earnest prayers. For anyone who prays and longs to see the renewal of the church and the transformation of nations, it's worth exploring the remarkable, remarkable events that shook those islands in the post-war years. It does seem that whenever God is about to initiate a new movement of his spirit, he begins by mobilising people to pray. There are many areas in the world where people have gathered and are still gathering to pray. Since 1999, an international house of prayer, IHOP, began by Mike Bickle in Missouri, which is 24-7 live worship, prayer and fasting, and is followed by many around the world. And some of you may be familiar with Pete Gregg, who recently came to the diocese to speak on prayer. It was also in 1999 that he began a prayer movement in the UK called 24-7. It's now spread to 22,000 prayer rooms in 78 nations. Most taking part are young people who've been impacted by Jesus and feel compelled to pray for God's kingdom to come. 1999 must have been a good year because in that same year, a 24-7 prayer initiative was begun by a church in Indonesia, which triggered a revival. It began with 119 members and grew to 40,000 in 20 years. Pete Gregg, in his book Dirty Glory, wrote about this remarkable demonstration of the power of the promise to transform an entire nation. In 1998, this fourth largest nation on earth was devastated by the Asian economic crisis alongside violent ethnic uprising on the streets. With a death toll running into thousands, widespread student demonstrations, and finally the resignation of their president after 30 years in power, the nation teetered on the brink of anarchy. Pete said that the Indonesian church leaders took hold of God's promise in 2 Chronicles 7.14 and began to establish 24-7 prayer. They began on the top floor of office blocks because they were forbidden from constructing church buildings. Praying with extraordinary tenacity and faith, repenting and seeking God, and humbly claiming his promise of healing the land. Gradually, the volatile situation began to stabilise, the rioting died down, the economy rallied and a new optimism dawned. Then the Indonesian church began to experience a powerful revival. One night, several years after those first prayer rooms were launched in Indonesia, 
Pete joined 80,000 people for a day of fasting and prayer in the stadium. The event was connected by satellite with other similar gatherings around the world, and there was an estimated 3 million people joining in prayer, surely one of the biggest in history. Pete said he had to keep reminding himself that this was taking place in the world's largest Muslim nation. We aren't in a Muslim nation, but we are told that, that those who say they're Christians in our country have rapidly decreased. We live in a society which seems to have forgotten God. We could feel depressed at the lack of integrity seen in people whom we expect to set an example. Mental illness has risen dramatically even in primary school children. I, I attended a safeguarding course recently where we were told that pe children as young as seven were now watching porn. No longer do they have a carefree childhood. It's heartbreaking. People are lost without purpose and don't know their identity. This country really needs Jesus. We long for a mighty move of God to bring revival in our land as we see so much going wrong in our society. The church is trying to do its part by organising outreach initiatives, but there's absolutely no substitute for prayer and no substitute for the Holy Spirit. Perhaps it's time for us, like those in Indonesia, to respond to Chronicles 7.14, which says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we pray for our nation, we pray for our world. We pray for your Holy Spirit to come in power to transform our world. Help us, through your Spirit, to be bold, to speak about you. Help us to be your disciples. Help us to be part of bringing your kingdom to earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you all. Thanks so much, Sheila, for sharing with us today. Uh, that is the final one in our sessions on prayer. If you missed any of those, they should all be available online, wherever you found this, on YouTube, Facebook or wherever. Um, go and have a listen to the ones that you missed. Uh, and we're going to be having our fourth of these series on what it means for us to be people of Christ in different areas of our life coming uh, earlier in the autumn. And we'll have a few other series and, and things going on between now and then. Now, we've got lots going on uh, in SBSJ at the moment. So just do keep us in your prayers wherever you are. If you're miles and miles away from here, you can pray for us, please. Uh, we've got the weekly stuff going on. We have a Kintsugi Hope Wellbeing course running at the moment. We've got midweek prayer time in churches. We've got the Nave trying to reach out to and engage uh, people midweek who are not involved in any church. In just a couple of weeks time, we are hosting our holiday club for primary school age kids. Um, that's going to be the first time we've done that in a few years. So that's quite exciting for us. And we are continuing to work in our ministry as part of the city centre church that we are and, and uh, working with our Ukrainian friends. And, and there's more and more and more. Do get in touch if there's anything we can pray for you about. Uh, or if you want to find out more, just follow the link and register to receive our weekly news in your inbox. Um, if you would be interested in supporting the work of the church, just go to the website and search along the top and there's links for how you can give. Uh, if you would be interested in giving to the work of SPSJ here in Hereford and wherever we find ourselves. But for now, let me just pray for you as we finish. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you hear us when we pray. We thank you that you call us to be with you, to spend more time with you and then to go into the world equipped by uh, and empowered by you to live those selfless, good and godly lives. Help us in the things that are ahead of us to know that you're with us and to be the people that you call us to be, the agents of grace and hope of healing and life wherever we find ourselves. 
and the blessing of God be on you uh, today and in the days to come and on your family, on those you love, those whose paths you cross. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bye now. Take care.